had our sunrise breakfast this morning, and I'm used to drinking decaf coffee, and they didn't have any this morning. So I drink caffeinated coffee, so I'm ready to preach this morning. I've got energy. I am ready to go. No, it is a wonderful thing to see all of you here this morning, and I want to ask you to come back and, and be with us. Next Sunday, if you do something two times in a row, it's a routine in your life. So come back and, and be with us. I want to share with you four facts. Now, if they're not right, don't argue with me after the service. I found them on the Internet, and everything you find on the Internet is true. Okay? Let me share with you these four facts. The distance from the Earth to the moon is 225,622 miles at, at its nearest point. The deepest part of the ocean is a section called the Mariana Trench, and it's 36,070 feet. The state of Texas has 254 counties. The condor is the largest bird on earth in terms of wingspan. Now, to the best of my research, those statements are accurate. What do they all have in common? Well, hopefully they're all accurate, but they all have something else in common that I want you to see. They're totally meaningless for us this morning. If you're sitting there, when I read those, you thought, what on earth does that have to do with the price of tea in China? What does it matter? All these verses, all these statements, they're accurate, they're true, but they're totally irrelevant. They have no bearing on us this morning. A lot of people view the doctrines of the Christian faith in the same way. You may believe in orthodox doctrine, orthodox theology. You may believe that these things are, are true, our beliefs, our, our theology. But in the back of your mind, you may say, well, I, I believe the Bible is true. I believe the doctrines of our, our, our faith are, are accurate, but I don't see their relevance. I don't understand how they impact me. Well, that's just not the case, folks. I want you to know that the doctrines of our faith, yes, they are true, but they are also relevant. They are relevant to you this morning, April 5th, 2015. And this morning, I want to speak to you about the most important doctrine of our faith. And I can say that in absolute terms, the most important doctrine of the Christian faith, and that is the doctrine of the resurrection. Everything we believe... Our entire system radiates from the fact of the resurrection. Christianity rises or falls based upon the reality of the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. How many of you here today believe in the resurrection? I hope that you do. I hope that you do believe in the resurrection and that you have experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ personally. But I also want you to know this morning, not only is the resurrection true, but it's relevant. It has a bearing on your life personally and the life of this church corporately. This morning, as we look at our passage of study, I want to share with you three reasons why the resurrection is relevant. If you will, take your Bible and go back to our passage of reading. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. I won't read them again, but what I would like to do is speak to you about this book as a whole, and then this passage in particular. The book of 1 Corinthians was written to a very troubled church. They were going through what we would call church conflict today. The church was divided into little cliques or little parties based upon leading personalities and leadership within the church. They had other problems. They tolerated incest in their church. They had an issue with drunkenness in their church. They also had an issue with um, certain church members bringing lawsuits against other church members. They had problems, to say the least. But the issue was, this was their condition, a problematic church with all of these issues, but they thought that they were super spiritual. They thought that they were the model church. I told our group on Wednesday night, the church at Corinth believed if you looked up Church of Jesus Christ in Webster's Dictionary, they believed that you would see a little note that said, see the Corinthian church. They thought they had it all together when the reality was not so. They were in pitiful shape. One of the issues that they had besides those that I mentioned was 
they had an issue with fundamental doctrine. They prided themselves on their education, on their wisdom, on their knowledge, so much so that Paul writes in one point in 1 Corinthians, you're puffed up by your knowledge. They claimed to have all these things, and yet they did not understand some of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. For that reason, in chapter 15, before the Apostle Paul ends his letter, he deals extensively with the doctrine of the resurrection. If you do not believe, if you do not accept, if you do not understand the doctrine of the resurrection, you have serious problems. And the church at Corinth had serious problems. Looking at the beginning of this chapter, verses 1 to 11, I want us to see three reasons this morning why the resurrection is relevant. I would venture to guess that most all of us believe that it is a reality, that it is true, that it is a historical fact, but I want us to go beyond that this morning and see why it has a bearing on our lives. Before I go any further, I want us to pause, and I want us to ask the Lord's blessing upon this sermon. Let's pray together. Our Father, we take this time and we enter into your presence. And Lord, as we do, we wish to thank you for Jesus. Lord, we acknowledge that he is your only begotten Son of God. We affirm that he came down, and he came down for one purpose. It was not simply to give us a good example of how we should live. He came to die. And by his death, by his sacrifice on the cross, we have life. Lord, we also wish to thank you for the glorious resurrection. Lord, when he died, when he was placed in the tomb, that tomb did not hold him. Three days later, he rose by your power. Lord, we thank you for what that means. The resurrection is you validating the claims of Jesus that he is the Messiah, that he is your only begotten Son of God. The resurrection is you showing that the sacrifice for sin was acceptable in your sight. We thank you so for the resurrection. Father, this morning as I preach this message, I ask that you would anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I humble myself before you. I acknowledge my need for you. I can't preach by myself. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. If I'm left to my own devices, I'll fail. And I'll fail miserably. Descend from on high. Give me the words to say and speak. Nothing more, nothing less. Let the word go forth with power, authority, and clarity from you. And Father, I pray that the same Holy Spirit who anoints me, that he would move among us this morning in a mighty way, that he would open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to receive the truth of your word. If there's one here today who is lost, who has not experienced the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ personally, I pray, Lord, that today would be the day that they come to know you through your Son. Father, if there is a believer here today, and maybe they've grown negligent, they haven't thought about the resurrection as they should and been grateful. They've been focused on themselves, their trials, what they don't have rather than what they do have because of the resurrection. I pray, Father, that you might convict them and bring, bring them to that place of repentance. Father, blow up on this message. Use it for your glory, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about three reasons why the resurrection is relevant. Reason number one, why is the resurrection relevant to us this morning? Number one, what I call the ranking of the resurrection. The ranking of the resurrection. I want to call your attention to verses 1 to 4. Look at verses 1 to 4 of our passage. I'm not going to read all of those verses, but I do want to read verse 3 to you. As the apostle begins this discourse on the resurrection, he goes back in time to that season when he was with the church at Corinth and the content of his preaching. He goes on to describe it, and note what he says in verse 3, the content of his gospel preaching. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 
and then he's going to go on to talk about the resurrection. But I want to focus on verse 3, and I want you to note some things that he said. I want you to begin by noting one phrase. He makes this statement, what I also received, what I delivered to you, what I preached to you is that which I received. Now, what does the Apostle Paul mean by that? What he is trying to say is, what I preached to you, the content of the gospel, it was not my opinion. It was not unique to me. It was not something that I made up. This is the accepted body of beliefs of the church. This is what I received. What does he mean by that? Well, the apostles received their instruction, their teaching, their doctrine, from Jesus himself. Then the apostles went on to dispense that teaching, to uh, instruct the churches that they planted or they visited on this body of beliefs. So the apostle Paul says, when I was with you, when I preached the gospel to you, what I preached, it was not my opinion, but it was the accepted doctrine of the church. And what was it that he emphasized in his preaching that was the accepted doctrine, that was what he received from Jesus? He makes a statement again in verse 3. He said, I delivered unto you as of first importance. He said, what I received from the Lord, what I dispensed to you, there was one thing that I focused on, that I emphasized over above the rest, because they were the most important, the most significant. And that was the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of all the things he could have preached on, he said, what I gave first importance, and that word first there, it means first, not in sequence, but by priority. What I gave the most time to, the most attention to, in my gospel ministry, in my preaching, was the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, I want you to know this. I want you to follow me. If the Apostle Paul, an apostle, inspired of the Holy Spirit of God, if he said in my gospel preaching, the number one thing that I focused upon was the resurrection, the resurrection should have relevance in our lives. The resurrection should be important to us. The resurrection should be significant in our belief system and how we do life. And maybe this morning you're thinking, well, I understand that. I understand what you're saying. I understand that the Apostle Paul said this was the most important thing in his life and in his preaching ministry. But, Brother Andy, times have changed. We've made technological advances. We've made scientific discoveries. We don't need the resurrection anymore to undergird our faith to undergird our belief system. Times have changed, and yes, times have changed. But hear me, the relevance of the resurrection has not changed. It is still the most significant thing in our lives as believers. And you may say, why? Why is it so significant? Why is it so significant that you're dedicating a sermon to it, that we're dedicating a worship service to it? Well, the answer to that question, the Apostle Paul gives it. He gives it in verses 1 and 2. Go back and look at chapter 15. Look at verses 1 and 2. Remember, he is reminding them of what he preached. And in verse 1, listen to what he says. Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. He said, okay, here's the content of my preaching that you received. He's fixing to explain what he preached. But in verse 2... He gives the results of them accepting that preaching. Look at what he says in verse 2. He says, by which also you are saved. That's why the resurrection is so important right there. That's why the resurrection remains relevant today. Because it is the doctrine of the resurrection that saves. If Jesus was not raised from the dead... If the tomb was not empty, our faith would be in vain. We would still be lost in our sins. That makes the resurrection pretty important, does it not? That makes the resurrection relevant for us today. Think of it like this. I looked it up this week. George Washington, the father of our country, he died in 1799. How many years ago was that? 216 years, I believe. Is he still a relevant figure today? Yes. What he did, 
his life is still relevant, still has an impact on us today, 216 years later. What he accomplished on our behalf as the father of our country still has a bearing on Americans today, 216 years later. The resurrection is no different. What happened in the first century, what happened over 2,000 years ago is still relevant, still has an impact today, and that is because the truth of the resurrection, that doctrine, is what saves us. So it should rank number one in our lives. That's why it's relevant. Now let's look at another reason why the resurrection is relevant. Not only is it the ranking, but I also want you to see something else, another reason, what I call the reality of the resurrection. The reality of it. Y'all are going to laugh at this. One of my favorite movies is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I'm I'm a nerd at heart, if you didn't already know that. I started watching that movie when I was a kid, and I can still watch it today. And I've got a good excuse. I've got a young one. I I can watch it now. I love that movie. I love that movie. It it comforts me. I, I get a kick out of it. I enjoy it. But are those things real? No. I hate to tell you this, kids. I hope I'm not hurting you. But there's not a real dad with a, with a car that, that flies and is a boat. Parents, I'm sorry if this is going to cause you trouble on the way home. There's not a, real, not a real dad with that kind of car. There's not a country called Bulgaria. It's not out there. There's not a child catcher. Kids, you may like that fact. There's not a child catcher. It's a fairy tale. It's not real. Some people think of the resurrection like that. Wow, it's warm. It's comforting in life. But it's not real. I want to tell you that's not the case. That's not true. The resurrection is warm. The resurrection is comforting to us because it gives us hope. But the resurrection is a historical reality. The Bible always presents the resurrection of Jesus as a literal, historical reality. It is a bodily resurrection. Now, some so-called Christians today, they're embarrassed by the resurrection. They're ashamed of it. So they come up with different theories to try and and, and diminish it or or, or put it to the side. I I hear some so-called Christians, they say, well, the resurrection, the Bible doesn't doesn't condone, it doesn't affirm a literal bodily resurrection. It's just, it's a myth. It's a symbolic myth designed to show the triumph of good over evil. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible continually, consistently rather, uniformly affirms a bodily resurrection of Jesus as a historical reality. It is a reality, folks, and on that basis, it should shape who we are and how we view life. I want you to see the way the Apostle Paul presents it. Look at verses 3 to 8 of our passage. This is a great example of how the Bible affirms a bodily resurrection as a historical reality. Let me read these verses to us again. Look at verses 3 to 8. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance, that's importance by rank, of first importance, what I also received, the accepted body of beliefs of the Christian faith. What was that? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. This is a great example of how the Bible presents the resurrection of Jesus as a historical reality. The apostle Paul, he does two things here to drive home that point that the resurrection is real. For our purposes this morning, I'm going to put those two things in in two categories just so we can follow it. He presents the the resurrection, the truthfulness of it, by the grammar and the content. Y'all say it with me, by the grammar and by the content. Now let's talk about grammar, first of all. Notice what he says in verses 3 and 4, how he goes out of his way to show that Jesus died. In verse 3, 
He talks about what he preached, what he gave preeminence to in his gospel preaching. And he says the first thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the beginning of the gospel right there. The fact that Jesus came and that Jesus died on the cross. So he makes that statement, Jesus died. What's surprising is the very next thing that he says in verse 4. Look what he says, the very next part of verse 4, first part of that verse. And that he was buried. Now, why on earth did he do that? Why did the Holy Spirit prompt him to make that statement? He just said Christ died. Why would, the, why would he then just turn around and say he was buried? It would seem obvious, would it not? You bury dead people. Does that not seem obvious? If I've been working on my dissertation and, and just struggling with, with grammar and with English, can I tell you what my instructor, my advisor would have done if I'd have made a statement like that? He would have written down redundant. You don't need to put that again. He died. It's obvious that he would be buried. Why does Paul do that? Why did the Holy Spirit prompt him to do that? He is going out of his way to make it absolutely clear that Jesus was a man, flesh and blood, a man who died. He's doing that because there is a heresy that's beginning to infect different churches. The heresy was called doceticism. It comes from the Greek word doci or doci, and it, it means to appear. What they believed was that Jesus was not really a man. He was a ghost, a spirit, a phantasm, if you will. He was not really a man. He was this spirit. So he didn't really die, and so there was not a real bodily resurrection. One of Satan's early tactics that still goes on today. Why is doceticism so dangerous? Well, if Jesus was not flesh and blood, he had no blood to shed. There's no atonement for sin. If Jesus is not a man, if he's not flesh and blood, then there's not a literal bodily resurrection. Spirits don't die, but men do. That's why Paul says Jesus died for our sins. According to the Scriptures, he was buried. He's going out of his way to say that this is a historical reality. That's the grammar. Now look at the content. Look at the content. Look at what he actually says in verses 3 to 8. In verses 3 to 8, the Apostle Paul is acting almost like an attorney. I don't mean that as an insult against the Apostle Paul. I can talk about lawyers like that. I got an older brother who's a lawyer. I can talk about lawyers. But he's acting as a lawyer, almost in a court, presenting evidence of the validity of the resurrection. Notice the evidence that he presents. He focuses on eyewitness testimony. And he says there were over 500 eyewitnesses to the gospel, uh, to the resurrection of Jesus, the centerpiece of the gospel. They all saw this, and they had a consistent testimony. He says Peter and the twelve saw the resurrected Jesus. James and the apostles saw the resurrected Jesus. 500 of the brethren, 500 believers saw the resurrected Jesus. And then Paul says, then I saw him. Then I laid eyes on the resurrected Savior. He's presenting it as evidence. And I'll tell you this today, boy, if I was an attorney... If you were an attorney, how would you feel about 500 eyewitnesses who were saying the same thing? I would feel pretty good about my case, would you? The Apostle Paul says it, and then he makes a statement in verse 6. He says, now some of, these, some of these eyewitnesses, they've died, but a lot of them are asleep. You know what he's implying? You can go ask them, and they'll tell you. That Jesus was raised, that the resurrection is real. He's going out of his way here, folks, to show the reality of of the resurrection, that it is a literal bodily resurrection. How many of you follow me today? You following me? Nod your head. You wait. What's the big deal about that? That it is a historical reality. What's the big deal? Well, this has certain ramifications for our lives. Just stop and think of the great ramifications of this fact 
that God raised his son from the dead, that Jesus overcame the grave. If God raised his son from the dead, then that son can save us of our sins. Amen? If the Father, if God raised that only begotten Son from the dead, then you and I can face the trials of life. What can't our God do if by His power He raised His Son from the dead? What can't He do? What can't He accomplish in our lives by that power? He can save us. He can give us strength, endurance to overcome the trials of life. He can mend broken relationships and bring reconciliation. He can help you overcome a sin, overcome an addiction. He can help meet your needs. He can make that paycheck stretch. He can help you get through all of those trials. If he can raise his son from the dead, what can't he do in your life? That's why the resurrection is relevant because it's real. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God that enables us to endure the trials of life. We've seen two reasons so far. We've seen the ranking of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection. Now lastly, I want you to see the revolution of the resurrection. The revolution of the resurrection. When you go through something traumatic or when you experience a cataclysmic event, it changes your life forever. I'll give you a little bitty example of it. My daughter, KK, Kennedy, she blows on every piece of food she eats, just about. I've seen her blow on ice cream before. Do you know why? One time she didn't blow on it, and guess what happened? Her little mouth got burned. It, if you will, revolutionized the way that she eats food. The resurrection, in a greater way, changes our lives. When you experience something like that, when you accept it, when you encounter Jesus Christ personally, it revolutionizes, it changes who you are. That's what the Apostle Paul says happened to him in verses 9 to 11. Listen to what he says. He's given this list of eyewitnesses of the resurrection to support his case for a literal bodily resurrection. And notice what he says in verses 9 to 11. He gets to that list, and he ends with himself. And listen to how he describes himself. Before and after his encounter with the resurrected Jesus. He says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Paul makes a statement that he had uh, experienced, encountered the risen Christ personally, and he says it was almost like a a baby born premature, because I I saw this, and he, he makes this statement because of the kind of man that he was. And when he encountered Jesus, he goes on to say in verses 9 to 11 how the resurrection, the personal resurrection, changed him. Notice the way that it revolutionized his life. Notice two things that it revolutionized. First, it revolutionized his worldview. A worldview, are you familiar with a worldview? A worldview is the way you interpret life. It is the key the grid, if you will, of how you interpret the things that come your way, how you make decisions, how you view the things that happen to you. Let let me give you an example of how a worldview of what it is. I've got a friend, and and he's got a dad, and his dad was very, very pessimistic. Anything that, that happened in life, it wasn't an opportunity for good to happen. His dad would always say if something was happening, it was happening for a bad reason. It's going to be bad. It's going to be terrible. So guess how my friend views life now? Just like his dad. If something happens, it's not a potential 
for some good to come out of it. It's not an opportunity. It's something to get depressed about. It's something to get sad over. It's something to dread. That's the worldview that he developed. Y'all understand what a worldview is now? The resurrection of Jesus Christ revolutionized Paul's worldview. Now, how can I say that and what do I mean? Look at verse 9 and look how he describes himself. I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Before the apostle Paul experienced the resurrection personally, he had a worldview that was diametrically opposed to the gospel. He was an enemy of Jesus Christ. He denied that Jesus was the Messiah. He denied the resurrection. Everything in his worldview was against it, so much so that we know the story of his salvation when he encountered Jesus. Where was he going? Where was he going, y'all? You know this story. Where was he going? To persecute Christians. And yet when he encountered, had a personal experience with Jesus Christ, encountered the resurrection, it changed him. The gospel that he hated, that he was opposed to with every fiber of his being, all of a sudden, he accepted it. He accepted it, and it determined how he viewed life, what he believed, the decisions that he made. He's not the only one. This still happens today. This is not unique to the Apostle Paul. I think of a great example of this, Josh McDowell. How many of you are familiar with Josh McDowell? He wrote a book called More Than a Carpenter. Before his salvation, he was an atheist. He was opposed to the gospel. And he was a journalist, so he decided to make a, a, a detailed examination of the resurrection of Jesus. And I think he said that he had it in the back of his mind he was going to study it in order to debunk it. And he began to study the resurrection of Jesus, to pour over it with a fine-tooth comb. And you know what happened to him? He was converted. He became a believer. Now the gospel that he so vigorously opposed, he accepts. And that is his worldview. Has that happened to you? Have you had a personal encounter with Jesus? Have you experienced the power of his resurrection? If you have... It will change your worldview. It will change, should, change how you view life and interpret things. How did it revolutionize Paul's life? Well, it revolutionized his worldview. Second, it revolutionized his life's purpose. His life's purpose. Look at verse 10. As a consequence of experiencing the resurrection of Jesus, it changed his worldview, and then he gives us the result of this. It, from now on, it determined his life's purpose. Listen to what he says in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. Now listen to the next statement he's going to make. But I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. He says, when I encountered personally the resurrection of Jesus Christ... It changed not only my worldview, but the course, the purpose of my life. Notice what he says there in verse 10. When I encountered the resurrected Jesus, the God that I opposed, the Christ that I stood against, I began to serve. And to serve with every fiber of my being. He says right here, I labored more than all of them. He's saying, I worked harder than all of my contemporaries when I experienced the resurrection of Jesus. It determined his life's purpose. Again, that is not unique to the Apostle Paul. It still goes on today, and it should. If you have personally encountered Jesus Christ, if you've experienced the power of his resurrection, then you should render your life as a living sacrifice to him. You should live out the rest of your life in grateful service and submission to him. That's the way in which the resurrection revolutionized his life and should revolutionize our lives. I wanted you to see this morning that the resurrection is not some old, dry, dusty doctrine that remains in a classroom. 
it's relevant today. It impacts our lives. It has a bearing on us. It has a bearing on you here April 5th, 2015. I pray that the Holy Spirit will awaken you to see that. Right now, we're going to have a time of decision. And I want this to be a two-part invitation this morning. First, I want to speak to you that are lost. I know that there's some of you who are lost today. Perhaps you've not understood the resurrection of Jesus. Perhaps you've not truly understood the gospel and the meaning of it. You don't have a relationship with the Father because you have not been to the Son. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and the resurrection is the crown jewel, the centerpiece of the gospel. Have you trusted Jesus? Have you accepted that gospel message? If not, I want to invite you to come today and to receive Jesus Christ as your own, to accept him as your Lord and as your Savior, to repent, to turn from your sins, to do an about face and make a trust commitment to him. I also want to offer this invitation to believers. Perhaps you are here today. Perhaps you're here and you are a believer, but you've grown negligent. You haven't focused on the resurrection as you should. It hasn't had the impact on your life that it should. Maybe you want to come today and you want to say, Father, thank you for the resurrection. Maybe you want to come today and say, Lord, I want the resurrection to revolutionize my worldview, to revolutionize my life's purpose. If that is you, then the altar is open. Will you come as we have this time of decision? Brother Terry.